Yeah. Welcome everybody to our session about supersizing your security, the next generation of stuff that you could do. Okay, obviously we tested this just two seconds ago and then it doesn't work. Yes. Perfect. So, Ruben, you can introduce yourself. So, I'm Ruben van Freeland. Uh, I'm an ethical hacker since I'm 14. I advise for the major Dutch uh, companies like Marktplaats, Satanel, uh, and I did some responsible disclosure for companies like uh, LinkedIn, eBay, healthcare application security uh, teams. Uh, that's uh, my name is Marco Dings. I'm uh, CTO of the Viria Group. Do some stuff in Joomla. You can contact me through the social media, but for this presentation, please use uh, JDA. No, not JD. Ah, huh, JAP. Huh. Oh, see, that's a leftover. Enable bit sensor or something else. Okay, we first going to uh, bother you with an analogy from the real life. Uh, so hopefully that will give you an idea why uh, present security is the most best. And there are even better practices. Uh, that you can adhere to, then we'll have some yeah. extra stuff on uh, practical use cases in the security incidents, some audit log demoing, technology comparison, and then we'll shortly touch on an open source uh, project that I'm starting, developing a plugin and component for Joomla to use this technology. So let's start with uh, the analogy of what it is in real life. So, I'd say when we want to secure our house, uh, yeah, how do you do that? You rely on your neighbor, on good locks and an alarm system. Yeah. And the tech detection might be the neighbor hearing the glass break, or you just come home from a vacation and you find everything ransacked. And yeah, well, you have to deal with the aftermath. So basically, you're too late, you're being reactive, damage is done, and you've got a lot of cleaning up to do, suddenly with the current, well, already with past uh, uh, government rules, but it's going to be even worse. So how could it be? If we compare the setup, uh, of your neighbor, that would be, or uh, uh, yeah, if you take it technically, that would be your sysop. Your good locks would be firewalls, and your alarm system, yeah, that could be monitoring your logging. If you take it next level, as part as what BitSensor does as a company, and where you can have a world, uh, yeah, uh, well, a slimline version for yourself, uh, you would have security at the application level. You would monitor multiple sources. Uh, you would have integration with uh, your firewall, which is compared to additional fences. And you would have some form of artificial intelligence monitoring that. Because in an intelligence system, you would be able to correlate inconspicuous standalone events or incidents. So if a car drives down your street, in and by itself, nothing wrong with that. If someone walks down the street, same thing. But if by art if someone cycling down the street, also inconspicuous. If someone he holds in front of your seat, uh, house to tie his shoelaces, yeah, why would it be suspicious? Someone checking the gate, Mm, yeah, that's kind of red flagging it, but if you use some form of artificial intelligence in correlating these events by the car's driver's license, uh, by the license plate, you could see who the driver is. By facial recognition, you could recognize that to be the same one walking down the street or one cycling down the street or pausing in front of your house. So correlating these incidents will make this last red flag, if he actually starts checking your doors, yeah. then you can immediately call the police because that's not an incident anymore. There's too many prior contacts to make that 
not, not uh, or to make that normal. Yeah. So from here, I hope that this analogy gives you some insight in better understanding what Ruben's going to tell us in techno babble. All right. So I wanted to start with a very practical uh, and very common security case. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And what I did here is like I, I built a quick timeline. So what do we have here? This is a Joomla component that was installed. Oh yeah, if you want to do it, that's perfect. That there was a year ago. Then ten days ago, there was a vulnerability release of that Joomla plugin. The CVE was uh, was published. Okay, so we know we have a known vulnerable component uh, in your application. Then the next thing uh, happens is that you are notified you, there is a vulnerable component in your application. You now know something is going on. The next step you're going to take is you're going to patch that specific vulnerability. And okay, so now your application is safe again. Well, the, the challenge is now is that this last phase, your customer's calling, say what data has been leaked? Has there been a data leakage? Well, that's a very hard question to answer because only <coughs> here you have applied the patch. Everything else happened in the past. How can you prove nothing has been stolen? So I think that's a very interesting question because there can be three moments here in this timeline where data can actually be exfiltrated. It could happen right at the beginning where there was a vulnerability in a component, a hacker discovered it, decided not to publish a CVE and just download your data, just exfiltrate the data. That would be the first step. Then the CVE is published. It could be another security researcher, another hacker uh, trying to create an exploit at just the moment that the CV is published and you haven't, you haven't been aware of the vulnerability in this application. And then between knowing what a vulnerable, vulnerable component is in your application and actually patching it, that's the last moment where data can be exfiltrated. And after this, this vulnerability has been solved, so we assume we are in a secure state. Now, how often does this happen? Well, of course, looking at the list of Joomla vulnerabilities, discovering a vulnerability is, is very common and it makes sense. Just as we as developer we, we create bugs, security bugs, <coughs> I just as easily create it. Uh, I just took the list of the CVE details uh, website with all the CVEs of Joomla. No, this is quite a long, uh, quite a long list. So <coughs> this happens very commonly and this is more and more an issue in an area where you have to prove that the application <coughs> is secure. Well, this list dates to I think 2014, but one other list is very interesting, I think. This Joomla component vulnerabilities that we have, the components that are installed in this application. Let's look at this list. It ends uh, in the beginning of April, it starts this list. And if we actually scroll down in this list, we're just uh, in the beginning of February. So this is a two month period. And it's already 50 known vulnerabilities discovered and published. So we can assume that there are many bugs, security bugs in components. I think that, that we can safely say that. Now the challenge is what systems do we have in place currently? Well, it's typically the log files. So the customer would call and would look at your log files. Has there been an exploit on one of my machines? Now there are typical challenges when it comes to just having log files. And to illustrate one of those challenges, I did this. I just, uh, well, as a developer, I tilt the log files, the access log files of my, of my application. And what I see is, okay, there's two post requests, two slash. Uh, yeah, I don't really see anything. What's the content, right? And that's where the typical problem begins. So if I would just post some data to my web server, by default in the access log, there is no post data available. So it's very hard to look back in time and see exactly okay, what happened to my application since the moment this component was installed one year ago. Uh, so what would you want to have in this case? Well, maybe it's the raw HTTP logs that you want to have. You maybe want to store them for one entire year. But the problem with just having these raw HTTP logs is that first of all, they're very privacy sensitive. And in the area where we are right now with GDPR, just storing raw access, uh, raw logs, you cannot do that anymore for, especially not for a period of one year. Well, one of the other challenges is it's very unstructured. So if the customer is calling and I have to go to all of my HTTP traffic, what am I going to search for, right? There's no structure in these things. 
So it's very hard to work with. We have more data, but the problem is it's unstructured, it's too much. So what I would propose is that we actually try to structure this a little bit further. And let's just take the idea of having an audit log of your application, having a record of everything that happened during the runtime of your application. So in this case, the component is installed, it generates audit logs. The moment that the CV is published during this time frame, you have audit logs. The moment you've notified, you have audit logs. Uh, and then the moment you install the patch, you have audit logs. And this is all in a JSON format, so it's easily searchable. So let's go a little bit deeper in how we can actually structure these logs. So in this case, I took roughly similar HTTP request, but it's transformed a little bit. So what we have here is a specific area, it's called context. So context tells us where did this request come from. In this case, the request came from an IP address. Uh, there's a little bit more context as was HTTPS used, are the specific cookies, what is the language shadow of the browser that actually executed this request. Uh, was a specific referrer, what was the user agent. So in case of an attack, in context would be the IP address of the attacker, the user agent of the tool that was used, all in a structured format. Okay, now we know where the request is coming from. It's actually very relevant as well to know exactly what input was sent in this request and to have that in a structured format. So once your CV is published and there is an exploit on this very specific parameter of the Joomla component, you can just search for that specific input. So that's what we have here. All the input that is sent with this request is normalized in, a, in this structure. So you can actually search for that later. And so what you see here is in the input is actually there's an attack right here. So who if you can recognize what specific type of attack this is? What's that script? No, no, no. Indeed, SQL, SQL injection, like it's a typical union select, email address, password from another database. So SQL injection attack. So this is in the audit log. Okay, and then one of the other questions that we want to answer, okay, there was a SQL injection attack. Okay, it, had, it was sent to my application. So which application was it sent? Because maybe it's only a vulnerability to a specific type of application or a specific version of the application. So in this case, in the endpoint, it holds your PHP versions, it holds the response to the application, it holds the name of the application that this request was sent to. So you can have that data to actually check was there a vulnerability during the moment of this request happening to my application. Now, one of the other things that is, I think, very interesting, because these first three steps, we can do that with a reverse proxy, like Nginx, you just do logging in Nginx. One of the other things that is interesting is if you apply this to your application's runtime, so you embed a plugin into your application, you can actually do tracing in your application as well. So what we did in this case, the application was logging its SQL queries uh, to stand it out or to the PHP error logging. Now this is interesting because if we also know what request was sent, so there was a union select uh, in the input, was there also a union select query executed Meaning, was there actually a potential a vulnerability uh, in this application and was it successfully exploited? Now we can know that because we know what happened in this application during the processing of this request. So that's there also in the, in the uh, application audit log. Now we can do that with login, but you can also instrument very specific parts of the application. So in this case, uh, we instrumented uh, your SQL query library so the library itself also was logging your SQL queries and appending that to the audit log. So this gives a very complete picture of what exactly what was happening during the processing of this request during this specific attack. So one of the other things that are interesting because we have this normalized format is that we can actually enrich this audit log. So in this case, we just took a GIP uh, database and uh, we enrich it based on the IP address that we have. So we can now add to the audit log, where did this request come from geographically? So we say, hey, this request is coming from the Netherlands, city of Eindhoven. So it's nice to have to, to append to this audit log, to enrich it. 
One of the other things that you can do with enriching is in real time you can apply a function. For example, you can say, okay, every request that has union followed by select, or I think, or a regex uh, pattern, that's very interesting. You can apply it in real time and you can extend this audit log with the result of this function. So in this case, where you first manually saw, oh, this is a SQL injection because you were looking at this input, now you can do this completely automated. And one of the nice things that you can do here is you have this detection, you know exactly what IP address this request came from, so you can build a map of all the IP addresses and all the detections that came from this IP address. And that means you can do things like alerting in real time. One of the other things that you can do if you make more sophisticated functions is you can run a function both on the detection and on the SQL query that was executed. So once you see a union select in the input, a, det a SQL injection detection is added to your audit log. At the same time, you see a union select query being ex executed in the same request. Okay, if those two things happen, now this is very sensitive and you can emit a new event to this audit log saying you actually have a data leakage, and this is in real time. Now, okay, so we have this audit log, maybe we store it on the machine, that's fine. But one of the other things that we have is we have open source tools like Elasticsearch, which makes this audit log streamable and queryable in real time. So I was wondering, how, of you, how many of you are actually running Elastic Stacks already? A few of you, and are you doing that to just get the log files, or is it for search? Search. Okay, for search. Uh, how many of you are using it to do uh, a centralized logging? Before I create my own. Okay, cool. So, just to explain the Elastic Stack to the people that aren't uh, haven't heard of Elastic Search yet. So, Elastic Search is a search uh, database, but you can also stream in logs. Uh, and on top of Elastic Search, there is visualization tools like Kibana, where you can visualize these logs in real time. So you can say, okay, how many unique IP addresses have I seen in the last day? Or how many attacks have we seen? Or which applications have been attacked? Those are all queries that you can execute in Elasticsearch and visualize in uh, Kibana. Uh, one of the things that I have to mention is uh, Bitbrain is our uh, non-open source component that has a little bit of machine learning uh, in there. Uh, but all the other parts uh, that will be uh, published in this uh, talk are open source and you can just take them off the shelf. Okay, so I think it's time uh, for a demo. And one of the steps that I already did, but I can show that is uh, here I'm uh, logging into my Joomla application. Is this uh, visible uh, enough? Yeah, yeah. What I did is I added the BitSensor plugin to this application. Yeah. Uh, and the BitSensor plugin is basically streaming these other log events in real time to my Elasticsearch uh, cluster. Uh, what I did is I set the username and API key just as a password. Uh, and one specific configurations, whether I'm behind the load balancer, et cetera, et cetera, where to take the IP address from, which log level should be uh, monitored, do I want to hook into SQL queries or not, and there are also specific optimizations. Because PHP runs in this uh, uh, per request model, it's sometimes hard to ship logs after the request has happened. So in this case, we have this optimization for fast CGI to execute uh, the sending of the request after the request has been processed. So the performance impact is very, very minimal. Now I can save this. And I can actually go to the application that is uh, running the uh, plugin. It's running in debug mode, so here it shows uh, the audit log that has been captured during the processing of the request. And here it shows this log uh, in an encrypted format that's actually used to send it to Elasticsearch. Now, it will show up here in my dashboard. And so here, in my Kibana dashboard, I have the URL of this application right here. And what I have right here is all the attacks that happened. Now this is our demo environment, so I already did a few demos today and it also runs our production environment. It also monitors that. So we actually saw a few uh, attacks today earlier. 
But what I can now do here is attack this application. So instead of username Ruben, I just say Ruben. So now what I'm doing here is I'm trying to attack this application from a hacker. I'm just discovering, doing reconnaissance, okay, which parts of this application have vulnerabilities. Well, in this case, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, in this case, you know, there are no specific uh, vulnerabilities uh, in this application. So my attack was not successful. However, let's look at what happened in, uh, in your interface. So one of the first thing that we see is we now say there is one attack running uh, run on this application. Uh, <coughs> it actually did some correlation here. So it said, hey, okay, this is an attack from one IP address and one user agent. It was attacking uh, bitsensor.dingsits.com. Uh, there was a type SQL injection. And what, what I can do here is I can say, okay, I want to block this hacker. Let's block him out of the systems. Or I can just monitor things uh, from here. One of the other uh, interesting things that we can do, but it is a commercial uh, uh, IP that we do, is we actually correlate several other logs together. So if the attacks look similar, we say, okay, those two IP addresses probably belong together, and then we, we group things, and then we prioritize uh, things based on the risk. Now, it's of course interesting to see it, like, you know, an attack happened on your dashboard, that's fine, but you know, you don't want to look at your dashboard 24 seven, you also want to have some sleep. So what you can do is just set up uh, alerting. And one of the plugins that we've built in open source is ElastAlert, uh, it runs on top of your Elasticsearch cluster. It's real time alerting, for example, alerting to Slack. And what I did is every moment, well, every, audit log that's coming in that has a detection in there, I want to be alerted on my Slack if the detection severity is high enough. And so I want to be alerted of where is the I address uh, coming from, what IP address does it have, what is the user agent, what is the type of attack, and what application was attacked. So in real time in Slack, I'm updated on all attack that's going to my application. One of the other things that you can do is you can completely automate this. So we say there, if there are three, more than three attacks from one uh, single IP address, just, just block him. Uh, then we have another Slack uh, channel for that. And this is just automatically blocking bad IP addresses. But this is completely distributed. So if you have 50 websites that are all sending their audit log, if there is one IP just doing one attack on one application and then doing one attack on another application, because your audit log is centralized to Elasticsearch, you can do this uh, logic across all applications that are running, and then you can block this uh, attacker on all applications. And this is in the plugin as well. And so if you're running Elasticsearch already, and you want to use this, we, we, it's Elasticalert, it's quite easy to uh, to build a new rule. Uh, for example, I'm taking bad behavior uh, here. Now this is uh, doing a correlation in a time frame of 30 seconds. And if too much events are happening in 30 seconds, uh, in this case, 20 events are happening in 30 seconds. So 20 attacks are happening. In that case, I want to block out an IP address and user agent combined uh, and send, an, uh, send an alert to, uh, to Slack. So this is quite easy to build. Here I uh, said how this uh, should be uh, formatted in Slack. And once this is executed, you will get Slack alerts. You can also just test out, just, just in case you're starting with this, how many events are am I generating with creating a new rule. So you can just run play right here. And this will run against Elasticsearch and it will show you what events have been, uh, have been run. Now, the example rules are also uh, online. So if you install this, it comes pre-packaged with some sample rules. So you can just play around uh, with that. So you have something uh, to work with there. So we just did integration. We were monitoring this in uh, Kibana. Then we are setting up uh, alerting to a Slack channels and maybe also do automated mitigation. 
So I wanted to finish with a quick overview. So okay, how does this compare to the other IDS IPS products that are already uh, out there? So one of the very common ones is IP tables, of course. So IP tables is very static. You want to block one IP address. That's fine with IP tables. Then filter ban is, is dynamic. It's really great for, for blocking out bad bots. So it can use IP tables or something else as a, as a backend. Um, Cloudflare, the same thing. Cloudflare works really well for blocking known CVEs. So if there's a known exploit for a specific vulnerability, <laughs> Cloudflare is great for that. Mod security would be the next step. If you want to spend time configuring mod security, you know, it really helps in, uh, in, in finding the humans that are attacking your application. But the last step, what I see is like, once there is somebody that's really interested in attacking your application and you want to know what's happening inside your application, the moment of the attack, in that case, you have to go in application. And in that case, we have the yeah, BitSensor open source uh, plugin because you can just run in your application and gather the audit logs uh, from there. Now for bot blocking or common CVE blocking, the audit log, you, you can block in real time with the audit log, but typically you want to do it distributed and then you're not in an inline mode, which means you cannot do IPS, typically runs in IDS uh, scenarios. So it's open source, feel free to pull request uh, on this. We're actually working on it. We just released uh, release candidate one. Uh, we're really happy to receive your feedback on what use cases are interesting or how would you, how would you like to have the interfaces and the APIs of this as well. I'm not a Joomla developer myself. I just built some, some PHP code uh, here. Uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about the Joomla plugin. So in the Joomla plugin, we uh, first the BitSensor plugin was only uh, for the commercial BitSensor product. What we did is to, to refactor it a little bit to make it for Joomla. So you can build your own uh, connectors, your own API. So you can add specific Joomla events that are triggered during the request execution. And you can add specific um, exception uh, handlers and specific connector. So one connector that you can build is you can connect, make a connector that goes to Elasticsearch or goes to Splunk or just writes to your local uh, disk's uh, log file. Uh, and what you can also do in the, in the connectors is you can add privacy sensitive filtering. So for example, you might want to strip out IP addresses or sensitive usernames, passwords, <coughs> etc. You can do that in the connector. With the BitSensor Propriety product, we actually do that in ingestion. So we can run our intrusion detection systems on the raw data and everything that's not an attack, we strip down the privacy sensitive uh, fields to actually hash them. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, yeah, just finishing off BitSensor, we're now protecting 1600 applications. Uh, we just hired a mod security core rule set uh, maintainer. He also sees that this is the way uh, forward. Uh, we're expanding the company a little bit. We're active now in the Netherlands and Belgium. We're looking for a German uh, engineer as well to expand uh, the team and to work on our open source uh, offerings that extend PHP that goes to Node.js, Java, um, IAS, engines. Um, we have this. Oh yeah, and most importantly, the thank you. As well, a few uh, Joomla fans have been uh, talking to me and have been able to ask some questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter Martin, and thank you, Rene, for spending time with me and answering my uh, stupid questions <laughs> and use case uh, related uh, question. Yeah, I just want to add a few words, and I hope that I can or we can uh, extend some talking with uh, David on the JSTT to see how we can get this uh, security plugin thing that I've started uh, out of interest and see if we can build that out uh, and help protect Joomla and possibly other CMSs uh, in a way uh, that's uh, more secure uh, and more active than we used to have. So then I think it's question time. Do you have questions in the app or yes, are have. there already uh... Roland D. <laughs> uh, it is not necessarily a bad thing to have a long list of known issues. It just shows that they have been fixed and taken seriously. Yeah, 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 that's exactly the case. You know, I don't want to say, okay, there's so many vulnerabilities, it makes sense, you know, there where there is software development, bugs arise and security bugs arise from the bugs that are uh, in the application. Makes sense. 
And you could possibly also argue that the applications or components listed are the most popular ones. But yeah, still, it, it, stuff that happens and if an inexperienced user... Well, and of course the Joomla code base is so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not crazy that you fix or build something in one place and something else falls over somewhere else. Yeah, at the, at the same time, a long list is also can be an indicator of a better security uh, uh, posture because if there's a very short list, there's either no security researchers have been looking at it yeah. or they kept it under the radar, uh, which we typically see with commercial uh, offerings. Uh, Roland also remarks that Elasticsearch <laughs> Isn't really an option on shared hosting, is it? Yeah, so I think it's very hard to run it on shared hosting. Uh, it, it makes sense to run on the VPS. Yeah, 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 yeah. What we typically say is that you don't want to store the logs on the machine itself because they can be removed in case of an attack has happened. Yeah. So you want to store them on a different machine, and a different machine, yeah, you can just run a VPS with, well, maybe 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, we run everything on Hetzner. Hetzner is running in, in Germany. It's like 10 euros a month to run something cheap. So it doesn't have to be that expensive to run uh, an additional server, but it is additional. No, but obviously part of the challenge is that uh, well, there are a lot of very cheap shared hosts out there. And yeah, well, you can't accommodate all, or at least uh, that's our, whilst we as Joomla try that, uh, I think we all know how difficult it is to accommodate all and every instance of shared hosting. So, yeah, I think because the choice is... What you get is you have somebody that has a $10 a month or $10 a year hosting and they're not going to set up a VPS for the login. Indeed, that makes sense, you know, it makes sense. Uh, no, but you have to start somewhere and uh, if somebody doesn't want to spend the money, okay, that's by their choice. Uh, but then we don't want to bend over backwards in accommodating them, uh, we choose them to first accommodate or facilitate the people that are seriously interested in hosting and <coughs> having a good professional service. Because it's not going to make us any money. <laughs> what do I need to install? No, by, that's by, uh, not by, that's oh, you want to? No, you're, uh, go ahead. Anonymous? Who's anonymous? <laughs> I think I know about yeah. everybody in the room. <laughs> What do I need to install setup besides the BitSensor plugin? So the, the plugin runs in the application itself. It ships these, these events to an endpoint on a different VPS indeed. So you would install Elasticsearch on that and Kibana on that. And maybe you want to run your own functions on this audit log if you want to go completely open source. Uh, in case of you are a BitSensor uh, uh, customer, you can just set your username, <laughs> API key and we run everything else uh, for you when you do the hosting. So if you have an API key, the login it is going to your environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we run uh, one specific environment for one customer and you can run exactly. all your applications in there. Yeah. And we can export uh, data or summarize data to, for example, uh, fill uh, fail to ban uh, with uh, yeah. data. Yeah, well, fail, fail to ban, you can do that. But uh, what we have is we have an, uh, what we call BitSensor Listener. It's a Go service that runs on the machine itself. Uh, and it can both instrument your application in real time, so you can block IP addresses in your application, and it can instrument uh, Nginx as a reverse proxy, uh, and it can yes, instrument uh, uh, IP personally tables. I do more or less the same, so I mm -hmm. use more security in yeah. the first phase, yeah. but from, uh, I would say, website application, mm -hmm. I fill a, a specific log with yeah. a specific format, that allows fail to ban to scan, mm -hmm. and after that, ban with IP table, yeah. uh, HTTP, FTP, and so on yep. uh, for a certain duration. So I combine all of that mm -hmm. and give all the material to fail to ban and specific rules that I created yep. to let the uh, cross website uh, be banned or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, with filter ban, it, you, uh, you, or IP IP tables, I must say, you can only block an IP address and you can only block. Not only, uh, you can block mm -hmm. also. Um, OS file, uh, you can block other things, uh, not only by IP, uh, you can block uh, add an entry in uh, OS deny or you can do whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's it's based on uh, TCP level level 3 or not 4? Not necessarily. Hmm? Uh, no, based on the rules that you have created. Yeah. Most of the rules in uh, fail to ban are designed for IP, mm -hmm. but you can create your own rules that are not uh, IP. 
Yeah, that makes sense uh, with uh, uh, with IP tables I was mentioning. Yes, finally, mm -hmm. in general, personally, ninety five percent it's an IP table. Yeah, yeah. But you can do other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what I was wanted to say is like if you only block the connection, one of the things that we saw is some customers are saying, yeah, if you block it, we don't know what's happening anymore. So what uh, we uh, when I do more or less uh, as you explain with mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. When you have multiple behaviors that are not correct, mm -hmm. uh, with fail to ban, I ban for all. Yeah. So all the website, all the mm -hmm. account, all the VPS, all mm -hmm. closed. Yeah, that makes sense. But I can I can challenge you a little bit because what you can do if you have a reverse proxy setup is you can actually just have a blocking page where if the user uh, comes in and he's a normal user. In certain case, uh, I'm very hard. I block all. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. And, and, yeah. and, and the first error, yeah. no yeah, yeah, yeah. second attempt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first one, I block okay. all. Yeah. Okay. So all IPs, all uh, logs, mm. uh, everything. Yes, okay, makes so, sense. But obviously it's a choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yes, as customer right. feedback indicates, people want to have choices and there act are differently. There some behaviors that I consider yeah. as abnormal. Yeah. Try to access the back end of yeah. the website from a, a place that is not authorized. Don't try twice. Huh? Makes sense. Just to, just to summarize, you can do it with filter ban, you can, we can do it with reverse yes. proxy, and we can do it in application. So we yeah. support everything. And I try to do it as soon as possible for performance reasons. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the behavior is wrong, mm -hmm. I forbid to do that on other website on, to, to save time. Huh? As sense. soon as it's uh, closed, mm -hmm. you avoid to run uh, mod security, you yep. avoid to run uh, your PHP, you mm -hmm. avoid to. because. Uh, sometimes you have uh, guys that are consuming a lot of resource. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's true, that's true. That can be used for So close the door as soon as possible. Makes sense. You should be the forerunner of her. Yeah. <laughs> I worked in security for a few years. It's good. So there's more questions, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on uh, how you're uh, preventing uh, privacy sensitive uh, information to, uh, land, um, uh, to, to show up in, in the log files? I'm thinking about um, yeah, you're editing uh, a user profile as a user, and uh, your new password is uh, showing up in the log files. Um, do I have to um, yeah set that up for each um, variable or query parameter that I want to uh, leave out of the uh, um, log files, or what? what yeah. yeah, so that's that's a good question. We have we are working on the DSL. The DSL has two components. One is indeed the, the key, so it can be like a password or can be called new password. Everything in there it should be hashed or uh, removed, uh, or in case of an attack, it should stay there. Um, so that's one. You can do that with a regex, or you can just match the the key. And the other thing is we can do it. You cannot also match the <coughs> value. For example, if it matches an IP address, if it matches an uh, email address, uh, then we want to hash it or remove it. So there's two ways of doing that. Uh, and we come with, we are planning to come with like a pre-configured privacy sensitive uh, set. So you can just apply this and by default, all passwords are removed, all emails and IPs are. are but you removed. have to do that on the plugin, right? Sorry? You have to do that on the plugin side. Yeah, yeah, you have to do it on the plugin because side. Because if you send the data yeah. and then like uh, modify it, then yeah. you already have a breach after GDPR. Uh, yeah, yeah, that depends a little bit. So you can yeah, either yeah, yeah. Uh, you can make a contract, but mm -hmm. essentially, like <coughs> I sent you the raw data. Yeah. it doesn't matter what you do with it. I sent the raw data. Yeah, you have to have an, a contract between the the companies. Exactly. Yeah. So if I, I, I can extend on that, I think the idea is that Ruben mentioned that there's going to be connectors that we can yeah. populate. They are not populated now, but that would be things uh, I'm interested in to discuss with David and all the other people in the GSTT to see, okay, how could we tailor that for uh, Joomla and have like a mod security type of uh, rule set, uh, but then GDPR or whatever. Uh, and then yeah you yeah, don't need to do that yourself then the yes. typical applications will be provided for and uh, at least the core and that could be extended with other setups for uh, other extensions or custom password login thingies uh, yeah whatever absolutely I, I was just responding because you have to do it on the plugin side yeah, no. wait mm -hmm. till you ship the, the log to the server <coughs> and mm -hmm. Because of then you need contracts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you did uh, between the companies. You do have a con. That's what we currently have with customers. Yeah. Sorry. It's your own server, so it doesn't matter. 
Um, no, then it doesn't matter. But then you have to do it on the, on the server side. Still, yeah. like yeah. It, it makes more sense to do it on the plugin side. Yeah. Just and to jump in here because if you will always need to have a data processor in the game because any kind of personally identifiable information mm -hmm. is subject to GDPR and IP addresses at the visitors are PII mm -hmm. and GDPR. So you will always, anytime you send logs to any external provider, you will always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We just have an off-the-shelf contact your site and it's, uh, yeah, but yeah. It, it doesn't matter whether you scrub the the, the passwords mm -hmm. or usernames mm -hmm. or any other stuff. Anything that is PII is subject to yep. IP addresses are. Yeah. So that means you always need to do it. I think that's a nice discussion for beer and coffee it because is, yeah. personally, I think and I have the opinion that there's legal obligations that uh, warrant uh, uses of IP addresses for security reasons uh, and as such they can be stored. But that's for coffee. It's, Let's it's not exactly discuss it now. Yet. Store it. It's just subject to DPA. So yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My my thing is more that um, I don't want to have a situation like uh, Twitter uh, where I'm asked to to change my password because they accidentally uh, put my password in an encrypted uh, storage. Yeah. 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 So, Indeed. Um, I'm, I'm even hesitant to, to say, okay, if it's hashed, it's okay. Um, yeah, you can actually be choose between hashing and removal. Yeah. And to come to a question, if you're just not shipping these logs, storing on the machine itself, you can just use log rotate and log rotate have the uh, hashed version or the removed version, have that for one day and then use log rotate to just uh, GPG encrypt the data that you want to store for a longer period of time. So that solves the, the privacy sensitive uh, uh, questions even more. Yeah. Well, a lot of good questions, but yeah, it's still work in progress. It's in an embryonic state, but personally, I feel it has potential uh, to enrich the Joomla ecosystem. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'm sure we are happy to answer the questions during coffee or beer. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah. or during the performance run? <laughs> no, no, I haven't performed the mind licking. But you know, I'm always present. But that's in mind when I set my alarm for seven o'clock, and then I turn over. and I think, okay, Roland is running. Yeah, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I pull up my blankets. <laughs> I have one more quick question. Yeah. Uh, how much is the performance impact? Yeah, uh, I, I should have added uh, metrics to this, but. Uh, yeah, I can now just answer. It's very minimal. Uh, if you do a few okay. SQL queries, you know it will. It's, yeah, it will be very, very light. So, so it's not anything. like adding like uh, half a second or something. No, 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 not like half a second. If you have refresh proxy, it's like two hundred microseconds, including uh, loading the blocking uh, list. That's in refresh proxy. If you run in the application itself, it will be even less than that because only logging. Uh, but okay. you can run A, B, and see the difference for yourself. It's it's very minimal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, microseconds, not even milliseconds. Okay, thank you very much for attending. I think we're at the end of our time. Otherwise, Jens will chop my head off. I overdrafted already two minutes on my last talk, so. Yeah. <laughs>